yeah, dude, super funny. Psych. As if banks these days still help people make money. Please. The rich get richer and we follow like we're all sheep. The banks serve Wall Street. Crypto serves all streets. The interest in crypto's on rapid ascent. What's your current interest? Like half a percent? I'm sorry, the bank's gone past its peak. But I want info encrypted, not hacked and leaked. If this crypto system will be our salvation, it needs to be centralized. It needs regulation. If our central... Three. Uh, all right. Number one, uh, we're going to talk about mass adoption uh, and uh, a couple interesting comments from leaders of major tech companies. Two, we are going to talk about um, this interesting contrast between how things seem to be going kind of from a market perspective with how people seem to be reacting to it. And three, we're going to talk about uh, why derivatives seem to be leading everything. So uh, first, on this idea of mass adoption, right? So I uh, woke up this morning to Reid Hoffman, the CEO and or the former CEO, founder of LinkedIn, uh, had financed and produced a, or presumably had financed, uh, uh, something on the spirit of epic rap battles of history around uh, pitting Hamilton against Satoshi Nakamoto. So Hamilton, the kind of originator of the central banks, of uh, the central bank in the US, uh, and obviously Satoshi of Bitcoin fame. Um, and I think it's like, it's so it's it's fun to me. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Epic Rap Battles of History. I'm glad he brought at least half of the duo that does that in to do this. Um, and I think it's just a, a more interesting than anything else. There's a lot of fun cameos um, and worth checking out. You know, I don't know. It's an interesting question about how much stuff like this actually matters uh, when it comes to popularizing Bitcoin, popularizing uh, cryptocurrency in general. Um, my, my, my feeling is usually that uh, mass adoption of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin is going to come largely on the basis of what it does and what it offers uh, financially and from a, uh, a value proposition standpoint in people's lives. That you can't just educate your way into it or meme your way into adoption. Um, that said, I think that it's important for it to be accessible and for people to have intellectual on-ramps to it. And I think that things like this provide a, a, a very different narrative and a very different story than the idea of it as a terrorist money or just, you know, black market money or whatever. So I, I'm all for things like this, especially from folks like Reid Hoffman, uh, who have the resources, um, and this is a great way to, to, to do that. So um, pretty cool, but I think it's more notable in the fact that it was one of a, a number of interesting comments that people were talking about um, kind of from big tech leaders around uh, cryptocurrency yesterday. Um, another one came from the head of Apple Pay, Jennifer Bailey. So uh, in, a, in an interview, basically, or a private CNN event rather, um, she mentioned that she thought that uh, cryptocurrency had long, or Apple thought that cryptocurrency has long-term potential. Uh, this is interesting in the context of Apple being pretty um, anti-Bitcoin, you know, uh, earlier in its life. Um, now, Neeraj from Coin Center points out that uh, he says, before you get excited, remember that this is the safest possible comment, which I think is true. Um, but at the same time, it's it's notable that it's coming up, uh, that it's on their radar. Um, I think in some ways it would be uh, unthinkable that it wasn't, but still, it's kind of an interesting little uh, footnote in maybe where things are that, um, you know, we don't really know other than Apple Pay and Apple's credit card exactly how they're going to put their, their you know, what, what foot forward they're going to have as it relates to this global game of digital currency and digital money that we're seeing um, with Facebook's Libra, with, you know, Binance Venus, with central bank digital currencies, where Apple sees its role and all that. But you have to believe that they're thinking about it. Um, it's got one of the biggest platforms in the world, and it would be almost inconceivable for it not to. Uh, what we do know is where Twitter and Jack Dorsey stand on this. Um, in an interview uh, earlier this week, he reaffirmed that Twitter will not release Twitcoin or anything like that. Um, and uh, he, the quote that, again, near points out is, I think open internet standards serve every person better than ones controlled by, controlled or started by companies. Um, so this is a, you know, we've, we've talked about this before on 3 I've talked about it before in LRS. I think that it is um, remarkable and notable to what extent uh, Jack Dorsey provides a counterpoint to um, the kind of the Zuckerbergian take on cryptocurrency in his uh, investment in belief in 
uh, Bitcoin as a, a and an open standard like Bitcoin as the right way to do a global internet money. Um, it provides a really strong pull. Um, it'll be interesting to see to the extent that w the market likes Libra, uh, whether that actually hurts him, whether he's putting some risk as it relates to public markets um, for himself because people see it, investors see it as a uh, as kind of a, an interesting money opportunity. Uh, and, and they want the companies that they're invested in to take advantage of it. Um, but I don't see him changing that anytime soon. Uh, so really interesting stuff, continued affirmations, continued reasons to be um, super kind of pro, pro Jack and uh, pro Twitter uh, as, as, a, as a medium and as a just a countervailing intellectual force. Um, with that, let's move on to number two, which is in fact also based on a comment from someone in technology. So yesterday, uh, Fred Wilson, uh, who's a, a very prominent venture capitalist, Union Square Ventures, has been um, investing in crypto for a long time, uh, wrote a, a post called Some Thoughts on Crypto. Uh, he's talking about Bitcoin, how it's making up almost 70% of the aggregated market cap. Um, and he says, and this is the quote that a lot of people pulled out, in some ways, Bitcoin is the one protocol that has found lasting product market fit. In terms of a citizen, in terms of a censorship proof digital store of wealth, there is nothing that comes close to Bitcoin. There are some protocols like the privacy focused ones that offer similar and in some case, uh, in some cases, better use cases. But for the most part, Bitcoin is our digital gold. He then goes on to state that Ethereum, as many of you know, confounds me. It has shown the way in so many important things, smart contracts, programmable, trust free computing, potentially proof of stake and a lot more. But it remains hard to build on scaling issues abound and many developers are looking elsewhere. Stable coins, he says, and this is kind of his third point, including Facebook's plans for Libra are a bright spot, much innovation in the sector, yada, yada, yada. Um, and then he goes to point on, though, there's plenty of disappointment to be had in crypto right now. Uh, he talks about some of the best performing projects have been delayed in going to market, uh, <clears throat> how regulation has held things back and a lot of the innovation is moving to Asia, um, how dApps haven't gone mainstream. Um, and there was a huge amount of uh, sentiment from all sides on this. Um, and, and, you know, it's not new as necessarily as a position for Fred Wilson, uh, even in this thread that um, Church Meester started, uh, there's a back and forth between him and Jameson Lopp, where uh, in 2017, Fred Wilson said that he thought the market cap of Ethereum would bypass Bitcoin um, by the end of next year. And then in 2018, at the Multicoin Summit, he talked about uh, his frustration with how Ethereum was being managed. Um, and Jameson Lopp made the point, sounds like Fred was learning the hard way that crypto networks are not companies. There are some that operate like companies, and I'd pose that for them, the crypto network itself is running with the trade-off of greatly diminished robustness. Um, so I think that the interesting thing for me is that this is something I've been noticing as well, that there's a real um, interesting divide or, or kind of contrast between the fact that on the one hand, Bitcoin is up, you know, three, three and a half percent or three times basically uh, cycle lows of $3,500 um, that we experienced in, in December, January of this year. Uh, it's up from there and it's been holding consistently at this 10K level, um, but then everyone is acting so goddamn gloomy as I put it. Uh, and it was really interesting to see the comments. Um, there was uh, some was uh, some focus was just around the idea of time preference. So people were um, people were basically thinking too short term. Uh, in terms of how they evaluate the success of the market. Um, some folks said uh, that it, it has to do just with the psychology of prices, right? So Miguel Canita says, uh, because we haven't surpassed all time highs yet, this is like Bitcoin at 600 in 2016. Many still didn't believe we were out of the woods yet, even after a year at 200. Full on irrational euphoria only kicked in really in late 2017, which led from 5K to 20K in just a couple of months. Um, some people said, battered bull syndrome. Some polls I've seen say about 40% of market participants didn't buy their first Bitcoin until the bull run of 2017. Uh, and 2018 was traumatic. Um, Dave Levine, I thought this was a great comment. We are in a transition from BTC as a globally tra day traded video game to BTC as an institutional asset class. This part is more boring, but a hell of a lot more bullish in the long run. So for him, the argument is just basically that uh, this part is necessarily boring. What's building is boring. Um, then there was a, a, a piece or kind of a, a, a comment that I thought was really interesting um, from Yang, Yang Ventures over here that says, 
Uh, the global recession will force, quote, a lot of strong hands to sell to pay the bills, make rent. Many people on Bitcoin Twitter don't have enough non-BTC assets or skills to be immune from a deep recession. Um, he was kind of the only one who commented that, but I think there's more truth maybe in that, that there is a sense of uh, general market nervousness of, uh, if not gloom, then wariness about what comes next. And that that might be creeping into the space. Um, but overall, the vast majority of comments had something to do with the fact that they're uh, that the much ballyhooed, much anticipated alt season had not come and didn't give any signs of coming. And that people had been for months, as soon as Bitcoin surged uh, in April or whatever it was of this year, um, you know, it started moving up again and it, it got all the way up to nearly 14,000, that the alts never followed and that so many people uh, that have been hanging on are underwater on their altcoin bags. And that uh, without that, it's basically just that it's it, this rally, basically, this the bull market uh, that we shifted into is really a Bitcoin only phenomenon uh, and that that is sinking in and that's causing this contrast and this frustration between um, the, the folks who are kind of Bitcoiners and everyone else, in particular Ethereum, which continues to kind of index lower as a percentage of, uh, of value as compared to Bitcoin or, you know, continuously. Um, I think it's a I think it's a really interesting and important thing to track just from kind of a narrative perspective, uh, because it is um, there is this this dissonance between uh, that Bitcoin price and and the just the, the the feeling and the sentiment. Now this is just my sample size. It could be off, and people could be bullish everywhere. But it does feel like there's this interesting uh, kind of holding pattern in terms of the the emotions of people in the space that doesn't seem to be particularly affected right now by um, Bitcoin price. Uh, I thought Ariana Simpson uh, had a great visual representation of this. She says, uh, both of these have logos, the, the Bitcoin logo, for those of you who are listening, not watching. If you can't love me at my 6,000, you don't deserve me at my 50,000. Um, Ariana, meanwhile, for those of you who want to dig in a little bit further to this question of alt season, had a great thread a couple of weeks ago uh, that, that ended with, so in sum, I believe claims that, quote, alt are dead and Bitcoin alone will make it are nonsensical. I am most definitely long Bitcoin, but call me after you've tried deploying an app on Bitcoin versus Ethereum. Alternative chains might not seem so useless after all. Um, again, there's, so what she's talking about is that p folks who have lived through cycles know that uh, at some point, things besides Bitcoin arise. Um, it remains to be seen, but I think that there's Part of the separation that's happening now is around use case as well and what these are for. And I think part of the tension that uh, that everyone's experiencing is just um, that in some ways what the aims of these different types of cryptocurrencies are is so wildly divergent that it's uh, it's hard to kind of even pin them down into the same industry. Uh, but uh, with that, I want to turn just very briefly to uh, the third and final topic for today, which is derivatives. <laughs> So uh, I recently asked, for those of you guys who watched or listened yesterday, I asked a number of different uh, crypto Twitter uh, personalities, entrepreneurs, VCs, content creators, uh, what have you, a bunch of questions about what they thought about the summer and then what, they th what their predictions were going into the fall. Uh, and one of them, uh, one of the folks who I asked was the crypto dog. And he said, uh, looking at the fall, basically that derivatives will continue to drive everything. And so um, this is something that I've been watching for a while. I think if you look at kind of 2017 and 20 early, 28, or early 2018, it was all about trading your kind of long tail altcoins on Binance. Whereas for a lot of 2018, as the, the bear market settled in, people were uh, you know playing playing the Bitcoin game uh, with um, with Bitmax, right? And uh, and you've seen just over the last you know f number of months such a huge amount of attention and focus on building um, Bitcoin specific derivatives and and these derivative products for the for the crypto markets um, and that just there's multiple pieces of news where that was really heating up this week um, so uh, Binance in particular. Um, had acquired uh, a crypto exchange JEX to boost derivatives offerings. So this news broke uh, earlier this week. Um, Binance has announced the acquisition of crypto 
exchange JEX or JEX, I'm not sure which, in a bid to boost its crypto derivatives offering for uh, for pro traders. And then this is super interesting. They actually decided to launch two crypto futures platforms for user testing simultaneously. So dubbed Futures A and Futures B, the new test nets are now open for users to play with using dummy assets with new competitions to encourage traders to get involved. Um, <clears throat> so the, again, this is uh, showing just kind of how much focus in some ways, even for you know some of the leading altcoin exchanges uh, to shift their attention over to these kind of derivative products that are much more focused on uh, uh, you know Bitcoin and just a few other assets. Um, there's one other uh, piece of news, another derivatives exchange that just um, launched. And so again, it's it's kind of you're seeing this trend over and over again. And I think that you are, you know, it feels to me likely that we'll see, um, some amount of bifurcation and decoupling that that continues, right? Um, <clears throat> if you look at the last year, year and a half, the people who are out evangelizing uh, crypto to institutional investors were not talking about um, Ethereum and dApps and smart contracts. They were talking about Bitcoin. They were talking about non-sovereign money. Um, and in particular, in the context of a macro economy where you've got negative yielding bonds that continue to kind of increase as a, as a percentage of the overall bonds available in the world, uh, where you have just kind of the, the um, insurgency of modern monetary theory, um, it's, it's, it's basically doing the job of um, highlighting the difference uh, with, with Bitcoin, with an actually digitally scarce asset that um, can't be debased through extra printing. So um, I, this is not to say that there's no value in, uh, in other things that uh, cryptocurrencies will do. Um, I think that there's we're going to continue to see innovation around uh, smart contracts and capital coordination. Um, there's so much activity and energy around DAOs. So it's not to be dismissive about those things necessarily to recognize that relative to the world right now as it exists and the, the, the larger chaos that seems to um, be threatening to engulf the market markets uh, and just we feel kind of in our bones, um, it, it, it's clear to me why there is such a divergence in terms of the narratives of Bitcoin and everything else right now. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how that uh, changes and increases over time. All right, guys, uh, that's it for today's Crypto Daily 3 at 3. Thanks as always for watching. Thanks for listening. Um, let me know what you think about this idea. Like, are you actually feeling the same kind of gloominess despite the pretty decent prices? Uh, and what do you think it is? Hit me up uh, and let me know and I will talk to you guys tomorrow. Peace.